Hi, this is Cassidy Kuchenbecker, the indoor environmentalist and microbiologist with Environmental Initiatives. Thank you for watching our presentation on mold beyond the basics. If you like this presentation and you want your coworkers to see it, you can either forward them this link or you can have us come into your office and do this in person. Besides this presentation, we have about 15 additional presentations on similar topics on the indoor environment that you may be interested in. Environmental Initiatives is an indoor environmental testing company. We assess buildings for various contaminants like asbestos or odors, water damage, and mold. We assess for people who are environmentally sensitive or who have allergies. Uh, we assess for water damage issues, figure out where the water is coming in, why it's happening, what to do about it, and other types of items. For myself, I've been doing this for about 17 years at the time of this recording. I've assessed about 8,000, I believe, uh, buildings for different contaminants. My uh, educational background is also in uh, microbiology and immunology. I studied people and how people interact with microbes. What we're going to talk about in this presentation uh, is water damage and mold as it relates particular, particularly to a real estate transaction. Now, if you get a home inspection report back that describes a mold-like substance or a microbial-like substance, uh, that can really freak out some buyers, right? They read a lot of hype, in some cases, online, and the word mold is really scary. So what we're going to talk about today is kind of the history. You know, why did we not talk about mold in previous decades and why do we now? Uh, what matters, what doesn't, and how, to do, and how to assess and address these situations. So we're going to start with what mold is, how to explain it to your buyers and sellers, what mildew is, what rot is. Then we'll talk about the history of mold uh, and what, how the media played into that. And then we'll talk about the health effects. What's real? What's not real? You get to hear the information from an actual microbiologist versus a journalist. And then we're going to talk about what matters, what doesn't. At what point do we care about what's in the building and what is normal? And then we'll talk about what consultants do and when or if you need us in a situation. Uh, and then we'll end it off. All right, so first off, we're going to talk about what is mold and how do you explain it to people. Mold is what we call a filamentous fungus. Fungi is a kingdom of organisms that includes molds, yeasts, mildews, rot organisms, and several other types of organisms. Uh, mold, if you can think of it, many molds like dandelions, they grow on the surface of the material. They have roots, stems, and seeds, basically. Most of the stems are called conidiophores, and for most molds, the seeds are called spores. So when we look at this picture here, it's a mold, possibly aspergillus. It has uh, the conidiophore and then the spores coming off the top. Now, where do we have mildew? And what is the term mildew? Most people, when they use the word mildew, what do we think of? We think of bathrooms, right? Or maybe we think of mildew growing in kitchens or in basements. Well, the truth is, Mildew is actually just a term. It's a term that describes mold that grows on live plants. So when you have like that white powdery mildew growing on your trees or on your grass, yeah, that's mold, but we call it mildew because it's on a live plant. Now, if you as a real estate agent or a home inspector or an insurance professional, if you're looking at an area of mold in someone's house and you know it doesn't matter, like maybe some mold on a window or in, on the bathroom surround, and you call it mildew because it sounds less scary, go ahead. We don't care. We're not laughing behind your backs at the misuse of the term because we understand why you're using it. However, if you're working with a professional, like a mold or water damage consultant like myself or a remediation contractor, and they use the term mildew, it's almost always a red flag that they're not as up on their science as they should be. We don't use the term mildew because it is incorrect and we don't want people to, to uh, question our knowledge. So watch out for that as a red flag. 
Now, something I get frequently as a question, particularly by uh, people who have lived on a farm, is that there is mold floating around everywhere outside. So why do we care about mold inside a house when we're exposed to mold all the time, especially in summer, outside? Well, the point is that the mold that grows inside the house is usually different than the mold you're being exposed to outside. Molds that grow and dominate outside um, are usually pigmented, so they're typically darker, and they can resist the UV light well. Uh, UV will damage the DNA, you know, killing or, or mutating the, the organism. Well, the molds that grow inside and dominate inside are usually white, green, yellow, and tan. They don't have a lot of pigment, and they can't handle the UV light very well. Uh, so these molds are more fast-growing, um, but they're also weaker, essentially. But the point is they're different molds. We are exposed to different types of molds than we were even a couple hundred years ago because of the differences in how our houses are constructed. Whether you believe in creation or evolution, Either way, our bodies in general are not well set up to be exposed to the types of molds we are now being exposed to in our buildings. So yeah, there is a difference between indoor molds and outdoor molds. Uh, and in addition, when it comes down to people reacting to water damage and moisture in a building, it might not even be the mold for many people that they're reacting to. It might be the dust mites that come along with the moisture. It might be the bacteria that grows with the moisture. So there's other things that we don't normally test for where we're using mold and why we test for mold as an indicator for microbial debris that's growing indoors because of a moisture problem. All right, so what do some molds look like? Well, they look like all sorts of things. Being that we're microbiologists, when we do our testing and our assessments, we actually pull out a microscope on site and we can analyze all of our samples instantly and that helps us with the investigation. So here's a couple of molds looking through our microscope. On the left you have that mold aspergillus. You see the stem, the conidiophore, and on the top you see that dark ball which is actually uh, hundreds of spores all packed together and then you see the little spores coming off uh, little clear dots. Each of those are about one micron. Um, over to the side, to the right side, you see a mold called catomium. This is a very common brown colored mold that grows on drywall, cardboard boxes, sometimes wood. The spores are much larger. Uh, they're kind of shaped like footballs. And uh, as far as we know, the mold on the right is actually far less allergenic than the mold on the left. All right, so what is rot? Rot is mold's bigger brother basically. Mold can only eat the surface of the material. Rot will send its hyphae and mycelia down into the wood, decay the wood, and use the wood for nutrients. Now, the mushroom that the, that the rot forms is not actually the fungus per se. It's actually all the root structure within the wood that's the fungus. The mushroom is there for two purposes, primarily. One, it releases the seeds or the spores. On the bottom of a mushroom cap, you either have gills or you have pores. The little spores come off of the bottom of that mushroom cap. The second purpose of the mushroom, however, is to store all the waste product. So as the fungus is eating the wood, it would die in its own waste. So it gets rid of it by shunting it up into the mushroom. So when you're eating mushrooms on your pizza, you're actually eating the outhouse of a fungus. All right, so there's uh, several different types of rot, three different types of rot that we actually talk about. One is called brown rot. Different types of rot organisms, they will break down certain parts of the wood that causes the wood to turn browner or more brown, and it breaks the wood down into small cubicle shapes. It kind of looks like the wood was on fire. We call this brown rot because of the brown color. The second most common type of rot is what we call white rot. Different types of uh, chemicals of the wood are degraded by the rot, causing the wood to break down into a white mushy soup. We call that white rot. There's something also that's called dry rot, but it's actually very rare. A lot of people will use the term dry rot 
improperly. They'll look at uh, some rotted wood. They'll say, hey, this wood is rot and it's dry. It's dry rot. Now, technically, that wood was wet when it rotted, and it was probably should be called brown rot or white rot. But dry rot really is a thing, but it's ridiculously rare. Dry rot is a very specific fungus that can grow near a water source. Then it can put a little feeder tube, like a very long straw. It can grow this long feeder tube about 30 feet long before it finds wood. Then it uses that feeder tube to suck the water up into the wood then, and so it can rot the wood. Um, this fungus, I believe, came originally from the Himalayan mountains, went into Europe, and then about 100 years, years ago was transported to the U.S., and occasionally we find dry rot. I've only seen this a couple times. It was interesting situations because we couldn't figure out where the water source was until we realized what organism it was. And then we found, yep, there's a pond nearby and it's growing on a stump near the pond and it's simply transporting that liquid. So dry rot exists, but you'll almost never see it. So don't use the term dry rot. So for the real estate agents, the home inspectors, the insurance professionals that have been working uh, for several decades now, you'll probably remember that people never talked about water damage and mold in the 80s or the early 90s, but suddenly something changed in the mid 90s. What was that change? There was a CDC researcher who looked at about 12 cases of uh, idiopathic pulmonary hemosiderosis in infants in Cleveland, Ohio. What is this disease? Idiopathic, we don't know why, pulmonary, the lungs, hemosiderosis are, are bleeding. So this researcher said, hey, all 12 of these houses have at least some area of mold growing of a black colored mold called stachybotrys. Stachybotrys, like many molds, will produce different mycotoxins, which are chemicals that are used to fight off other molds or bacteria. A mycotoxin produced by stachybotrys, one of them can cause bleeding. So it must be that these infants are inhaling the mycotoxins causing the bleeding lungs. Now, this created a lot of headlines. I mean, think about it. Black mold kills babies, you know, literally. Uh, and that's what created a, the initial big scare. So the media, not the industry, the media created the terms black mold and toxic mold. Uh, and that resulted in various lawsuits. Insurance companies were doling out millions and millions of dollars because they had no idea what to do about the situation. Uh, they were losing lawsuits. They were paying out uh, small projects that were charged tens of thousands of dollars more than they should because they didn't know. So there was this mold craze at the late part of the 90s and early parts of the 2000s. However, the CDC pretty quickly realized their study was wrong. The math was wrong, the premise was wrong, and they finally took it back in late 1999 with a retraction in 2000 that said, whoops, we were wrong. The mold had nothing to do with the, the, with the bleeding lungs. But it was too late. The media had already created this hype regarding black mold, uh, and there was really no going back from there. However, a lot of study and research was put into water damaged buildings and health because of the hype. And what researchers realized is that, yeah, water damaged buildings uh, matter and dampness matters. In 2004, the U.S. National Institutes of Health released a large meta study where they said, yeah, when we look at the data as a conglomerate or in general, dampness and water damaged buildings affect some people but even without the presence of mold. So it's not necessarily the mold in many of these buildings causing people, some people to get sick. It could be the dust mites that grow in moisture. It could be the bacteria that's growing in moisture, but it's stuff in general. And then in 2007, the World Health Organization released another large meta study that agreed with what the US said. Yeah, we care about dampness, uh, but why do people focus on mold? Well, some of it is because of the hype. And uh, some of it, however, is simply because mold is easier to test for 
than the other things that come along with moisture. So we use the physical assessment and we use testing for mold to tell us whether or not you have a building that's been impacted by water damage or mold or water damage or dampness. However, however, when it comes down to water damage and mold, uh, we still use mold as the indicator because it's easier to test for mold than it is for bacteria or other items. And it's, it's a better indicator as to whether there's water damage or dampness issues that we're simply not seeing with our eyes. So anyways, let's talk about mold and the health effects. Okay, let's start talking about health effects just from mold itself. So the number one health effect people are going to experience is irritation. If you walk into a building and you inhale a whole bunch of microbial debris, you're going to have mucus production. A lot of people will get watery eyes, a little bit of a stuffiness, uh, and that can happen whether or not you're sensitive. Allergies can also happen. About one out of four people or 25% of the population has some sort of allergy, right? Whether you're allergic to cats, dogs, maybe your kids. One out of four people is gonna say ha to something. For mold, it's about 10 to 15% of people who are specifically allergic to mold. But when it comes down to mold allergies, it has to be the right mold for the right person. Uh, if you have allergies to cats or dogs, you don't say you have mammal allergies. What does that mean? I mean, do you have allergies to walruses and goats? Maybe, who knows? The point is it's the right mold to the right person, just like it's the right animal to the right person. So molds are uniquely uh, individual. So a person can't just say, I have mold allergies, this house is gonna make me sick. They don't really know. Also, most mold allergies are delayed. When people think of allergies, they think of the immediate reactions, like if a cat jumps on your lap and you start sneezing right away and you throw the cat off. That's an immediate reaction. However, most mold reactions are delayed. Think about when you were a kid, you were running through the forest, enjoying your youth one day, and then you wake up the next day filled with rashes, crying for your mom because you got into the poison ivy. That's a delayed reaction. That's also an allergic reaction. Most mold allergies are actually delayed. Uh, asthma can happen, but it's very rare. And the reason is, I guess, is that most asthma triggers are instant versus the delayed reactions. Infections can happen, sure, but they're really rare. You have to be very immunocompromised uh, or have like extreme diabetes to be worried about infections. Uh, chronic inflammations is something that affects about 2% of the population. Essentially what happens is these people go into a water damaged building, they inhale a bunch of microbial debris, and their immune system overreacts. They get all sorts of strange symptoms. They get joint pain, they get muscle aches, they get short-term memory problems, they get lost driving to work. They used to think that this was the result of uh, inhalation of the mycotoxins, right? Those chemicals produced by the molds. But we know it has nothing to do with mycotoxins as far as we can tell. Essentially, if you were going to get sick from the mycotoxins produced by the mold, you would have to essentially lick the walls of the mold in order to get enough of the mycotoxin in your body. And if you're licking the walls, you have other problems besides the mold. What we now know though is that there's multiple types of inflammagens or things that can make the immune system inflame. Uh, bacteria, mold, dust mites, all sorts of stuff grow in these water damaged buildings that's causing these um, chronic inflammations. All right, so what's our overall message regarding health effects? Well, first off, when Mr. Jones calls you up concerned because the word mold showed up in the home inspection report, you can say, well, Mr. Jones, we're gonna take your situation seriously and we're going to address this. But I have to tell you, 75% of people don't really react to water damage and mold. They or don't have reactions that they even notice. Most of those who are gonna react, it's just gonna be an exaggerated uh, mucus production. But 10 to 15% of people, sure, they can have allergies. Most of those are nuisance allergies that'll go away once we address this situation. Yeah, a smaller percentage of people can have this chronic inflammation. Those people, though, usually have under, underlying health conditions like uh, multiple sclerosis or lupus. Uh, asthma can happen, but yeah, it's really rare, as is infection. But Mr. Jones, if you do have an underlying health condition that you might be concerned about, let's talk about it. Otherwise, we're going to address the situation, we're going to clean it up, and we're gonna move on. All right, so what matters, what doesn't matter? 
You got the home inspection report back. It says there's mold in the attic, there's mold in the basement, or there's mold in the kitchen. Well, at what point do we need to think that this is a normal amount or not a normal amount? When it comes down to what matters or what doesn't, I, the basic place to start is how much. You know, how big of an area is impacted? The EPA puts together some guidance that says, look, essentially, if you have less than 10 square feet of water damage or mold, it's probably not that big of a deal. Figure out why the water damage happened, stop it from continuing to happen, and fix the area. If you have between 10 and 100 square feet, yeah, that might matter. At least talk to somebody. Send pictures to a consultant, figure out what's going on. If it's closer to the 100 square feet, you know, a consultant like myself might suggest coming out. If it's closer to the 10 square feet, I might just give you feedback by email that gets you on your way and tells you what to do. If you have more than 100 square feet of water damage or mold, it's probably a big deal. You'll probably need a consultant, and unless somebody's really handy uh, and knows they're unsensitive, there's a good chance they're gonna get a restoration company in to help deal with the situation. So when the EPA uses this 10 square foot rule, what are they thinking of? Really, they're trying to make it foolproof, so they're, they're thinking of the worst case scenario of 10 square feet. And what grows mold the thickest, right? What's the worst case scenario for building materials that gets impacted by mold? That's drywall, gypsum board, right? We've all seen drywall or gypsum board that's soaked up water for a while, right? It's green, it's pink, it's yellow, it's black. It looks like a horrible 60s velvet couch. Well, that's really thick mold. But you know, a lot of the mold that we deal with in Wisconsin, and Illinois, and Iowa, and Minnesota, is not always this situation. We deal with a lot of damp basements, you know, foundation walls that are that are growing mold, you know, block walls and concrete walls and attics. So as consultants, we generally stretch this 10 square foot rule for foundation walls and for attics. Usually what we say as a company is, look, if you have less than 30 square feet of discoloration on your foundation wall, we don't care. Fix why the moisture was coming in, but what is growing on your foundation wall doesn't really matter. In fact, you could have hundreds of square feet of dark colored found mold on your foundation wall, and we still don't think that the mold on the foundation wall is impacting air quality. The reason is there's not enough nutrients on the paint or on the, on the wall on the foundation itself to allow for thick mold growth. What happens is the mold is trying to grow but it can't find any nutrients. So it releases more and more of the enzymes. Mold grows like a spider. It shoots enzymes out of its body. The enzymes will digest the material to try to, to, try to create nutrients and then it will suck it back in. Those enzymes are dark colored. That's what causes the staining in the material. So on a foundation wall you'll see a whole bunch of staining darkness but under the microscope, I see barely any mold. Now, if I just told you that hundreds of square feet of mold on a foundation wall doesn't actually matter for health, then why do I even say this 30 square foot rule idea for foundation walls? And the reason, the reason I say this is because if you have more than 30 or 50 square feet of mold on your foundation wall or discoloration, many times you will have enough moisture coming through the foundation wall that you'll have light like white and yellow colored mold growing and other stuff in the basement because of the excess humidity. So what you have to look at not only the foundation wall, but really what I'm looking at are the floor joists, the furniture, the other items stored in the basement. Are those moldy because of the moisture coming through the foundation wall? That's what actually matters when it comes down to basements. So with basements, uh, if, this, if the area is small of discoloration on the foundation wall, yeah, clean it off, make it look pretty. It's a cosmetic issue. And then fix your moisture source. If, however, you have a musty odor in the basement, a musty odor um, indicates you, you have more mold than you realize. And it just comes down to how much. And that's usually when you get a consultant like myself to come in to do testing to figure out what's all affected and what needs to be addressed. We have the same idea with attics. So first off, with attics, dark colored molds that grow in attics are almost always outdoor mold. 
they don't impact air quality. They grow over multiple years. White and green molds in attics need a lot more moisture than the dark colored molds to grow. White and green attics mold in attics almost always indicates you have bursts of moisture or a new moisture source. So you could have like two square feet of green mold in an attic because something changed in the house. And three weeks later, that green mold, instead of being two square feet, can take over the whole attic because of, a, of the new moisture source. Other times, two square feet of mold in an attic is simply right above a shower, and it's a singular spot that gets hit by a lot of moisture over and over again. What we tell people is that if you have a green or white mold in an attic, almost always have us come out because you could have something that goes from small and manageable to the whole attic pretty quickly. If you have dark colored molds in your attic and you know why the moisture, why the humidity entered the attic to cause the problem, maybe you don't need us because that's the key is stopping the moisture. So basically, if you have 30 square feet or less of dark discoloration in your attic, send me some pictures. I probably won't come out. I'll give you some good ideas on what to do. The mold is going to be, or the moisture that's causing the mold, if it's 30 square feet or less, is probably right below it. And what you need to do is move the insulation from the attic floor to see where the air is getting into the attic so you can air seal the attic floor so the air doesn't come up to bring the moisture with it. All right, so that's attics. So for the attics, by the way, you're not cleaning attics for health reasons. You're cleaning attics for cosmetic reasons. Attic mold, even if it's the whole attic, does not get into the house. Uh, attic mold looks bad, and that's why people address it. Some people don't address it. And they don't care. But no matter what, you have to make sure the moisture problem, the mo air that gets into the attic, is stopped so the condensation doesn't happen. So when you look at this attic picture, you might go, holy moly, this looks horrible. But you know what? This isn't affecting air quality, but yeah, you have a moisture problem. So let's look at the attic floor to figure out where the humidity gets in. Um, a lot of people think that they can stop attic condensation by simply opening the vents, like the soffit vents more, or adding more vents, like a ridge line vents, or adding more uh, turtle vents or whatever to get more outdoor air in the attic. It doesn't work. Never trust adding more ventilation to the attic to stop your moisture problem. In this situation, here's a great example, uh, where we have our soffit chute. This is where most of the cold air comes up. The white colored mold, which needs more condensation, is happening in this attic only above the soffit chutes because that's simply where the coldest air is and the most condensation. You can't vent moisture out of an attic fast enough to stop the condensation. So don't hire a roofer to add vents. Hire somebody to figure out where the air gets through the attic floor and air seal the attic floor. Now, sometimes uh, the bathroom exhaust ductwork or uh, laundry exhaust ductwork is venting into the attic. Yeah, that's a huge moisture source, but never stop there because that could just be one of the moisture sources and that's just the obvious one. So always look further than just the ductwork. By the way, if you are gonna pay somebody to vent the bathroom exhaust fan out of the attic, do not let them vent it simply near a vent. That exhaust ductwork has to vent through the attic, uh, through the roof decking, not just simply close to a vent. Here's an example of an attic that had a lot of attic condensation. In this situation, the recessed lights were not air sealed, and so air was getting up around each light and because of the soffit details, the lowering of the ceiling above the cabinetry, air was able to get into the attic at each wall because of the way the, by the, because the tops of the wall cavities were exposed. If that sounds a little confusing, um, I do have pictures. You can always email me to ask for a better explanation. But you have to find out why the attic floor is not sealed and stop the air from entering the attic. All right, so the question is, do you need a consultant? Do you need someone like Cassidy or one of my associates to come in to figure out your problem? What do consultants do? Number one, the first thing we do is a physical assessment. If you, have a, if you hire someone to come in to do a mold assessment and all they do is walk around quickly and take some air samples, 
that's not a mold assessment. You have to physically assess for sources of moisture that you can't see with your eyes, right? And because you can't see with your eyes, you have to use devices like moisture meters, sometimes infrared cameras to scan walls, scan floors for hidden moisture. A good physical assessment usually lasts about an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, you Consultants figure out where the damage is and why it happened. If your consultant doesn't tell you why your wall got wet, what good is that? So they tell you why it happened and what to do about it. Usually this assessment also includes taking samples from surfaces for mold. You can't always see the mold growth with your eyes. Like in basements, if you have a musty basement, you can have white colored mold growing in the dust and there's no way you can see it with your eyes, which is why often we'll be taking the microscope out and we'll, take, we'll, we'll be taking samples of surfaces as part of the physical assessment. Then you typically will have a consultant determine what the occupant exposure is. Usually that means that we're gonna be taking samples from the dust on surfaces and from the air to see how much loose moldy debris is floating around. Taking samples from the dust on a surface is more important than taking samples from the air. The reason is, What's in the air is only what's in the air at that moment. If you have a lot of air movement, you know, you might have an abnormal amount that's in the air. Or let's say you take your air sample and no one's in the house, most of that moldy debris could be on the surface and you'll miss it on the air sample. So you need dust and air samples to do a proper occupant exposure test. Uh, then we report on what we found and we give you recommendations on how to address the current damage and how to prevent additional damage. Sometimes we're also hired after the work is done to uh, assess and ensure the work was completed properly and conduct testing to make sure the place was cleaned properly. All right, so overall review. First off, most people will not react to mold beyond irritation. Most of the time, a mold situation is addressed more because you want to make sure that the house hasn't lost value and that when guests or family members or someone else arrives, that you don't unluckily get somebody who's hypersensitive. If a person's going to react, it has to be the right person to the right mold. Just because a person reacts to some molds doesn't mean they're going to react to the mold that's in that specific house. Uh, addressing mold is pretty easy. You clean up the situation, you figure out what's going on, and you fix the water source so it doesn't happen again. Every situation can be resolved. Sometimes it's as easy as uh, a neighbor or a handy relative. Sometimes it's a handy, handy service. Sometimes it's a contractor. Uh, you might need a restoration company to do the cleaning. You might need a consultant to figure out what's going on and guide the process. If you do have additional questions, you can call or email me. We love to look at pictures. Uh, we'll give you comments on what we see. It's how we market. Uh, maybe one out of every four situations we actually go out to, and we're totally fine with that communication. You can also use this for other things like odors or chemical exposures or allergens and other items. Please email me at ck at eimidwest.com or call me at one of the numbers that you see. Again, if you like this presentation, you can have us come in to your office uh, for this topic and many other environmental topics.